Welcome, welcome. On behalf of Copyright Clearance Center and the London Book Fair, I'm very happy to welcome you to a special program we call The Data Dilemma. If you wonder about the value of big data, you only need to turn your attention to the papers, the Panama Papers. The story was astonishing in its scale, a potentially massive offshore tax evading and money laundering scheme to protect the wealth of the super rich and the powerful. But the billions of dollars and pounds were dwarfed by the data. 2.6 terabytes of data in over 11 million leaked documents that uncovered the possibly illicit activities of 214,000 companies in 21 offshore jurisdictions. The insights in the data were uncovered after a year of data mining and analysis by members of the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. The newsroom of 2016 has become a data center. Yet the same could be said of almost every company and institution grappling with how to extract value from data, how to gain insights, accelerate innovation, and grow revenue. It's a big job and getting bigger. Of the world's vast collection of data, information, and creative works in every imaginable form, 90% came into existence in just the last two years. Yet publishing, which is producing data faster and in ever larger quantities, has arguably been slow to embrace the possibilities of big data. As the Panama Papers have demonstrated, it is now possible to collect and analyze data more quickly than ever before through the use of unparalleled computer power and computing methods like natural language processing. Today, we live in a world of data. Andrew McAfee, a co-founder of MIT's initiative on the digital economy, has rightly said the world is one big data problem. Data answers questions and it raises many more. Big data, in fact, is so big, it can only be understood, uh, understood rather, from the vantage of perspective. Filters are necessary. In publishing for the 21st century, data is the product. It empowers and unleashes our content assets. It must be mined, it must be managed, and it must be shown to us. And to learn about the data dilemma and how it is being managed and delivered, you know, data being delivered to you, the readers, the researchers. We have a wonderful panel, a series of presentations, and a discussion with you following the presentation. So please stay for that discussion. We want to hear from you and your thoughts. I want to briefly introduce those who are joining me here on the stage. I'll start with our first presenter today. Um, Haralamus Babis Marmanis is Copyright Clearance and is Chief Technology Officer and Vice President of Engineering and Product Development. Welcome, Babis. Um, Jim Bryant is co-founder and CEO of Trajectory, a global digital distribution and book discovery network. And Sybil Wong is head of marketing and communications for Sparho, a startup providing an AI-driven recommendation engine matching users from 80 countries with the latest scientific content. We'll hear from each of them in turn. We'll start with Babis. Um, we will hold the questions until the end of the program. Appreciate your attention and we'll, we'll get started then with Babis. Welcome. Thank you, Chris, and welcome, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you today. Um, I am Babis Marmanis, as Chris mentioned. Uh, I serve as the Chief Technology Officer and Vice President at Copyright Clearance Center. I would like to spend a few minutes with you today and discuss um, what we mean in broad terms uh, about the, when we say the, the data dilemma. Uh, today, the entire publishing industry, like every other industry, relies more and more on technology. Uh, and I think this is especially true for, for scholarly publishers, but it's true for everyone. Technology is playing an increasingly bigger role in the infrastructure of our businesses. Uh, as customers demand faster, easier, and uh, comprehensive access to the content of your journals and your books. Uh, the content of um, these creative works, uh, the number of times that have been downloaded, uh, the number of times they have been shared, uh, the things that are written about them, all that is data. And technology is making, uh, making it possible, allows us to capture this data and process this data faster than ever, ever before. Also allows us to share this data with sister organizations and also access, tap on other data external to our organization, uh, such as things in public domain or even proprietary. So, 
um, we often hear um, the term big data tossed around to the point of cliché, but it is a reality. Last uh, uh, report from SDM uh, mentions that there have been 2.5 million articles published last year. 2.5 million articles, about 7,000 articles if you do the math uh, every day. Um, that's a lot of data. And we're told by industry leaders and uh, observers alike that data is the new oil and information the new petroleum. Uh, but data, but all by itself, um, does not have a, a direct business value uh, beyond its own uh, context. And um, take, for example, a piece of paper, write a number down, uh, that's data. So, um, in my view, uh, the data dilemma, uh, if there is a dilemma, uh, which uh, we'll talk about, is more about what to do with the data. How can we extract uh, meaning and value from it? But rather than thinking uh, about the data as the new oil, I like to think about data as a, the land that contains the oil. And the whole process um, of finding where the oil is Dig, digging and extracting that to obtain value from it um, is what really um, the, 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 the matter of interest uh, should be. Uh, well, if we are able to capture this data and process this data, and uh, if the whole point is to deliver a higher value to our customers through that, um, what changed? Why is it different now? Why now? Why are we talking about it now? Um, well, uh, there are three things that, that have changed uh, in the past uh, few years. One is increasing computing um, power. Two is programmable infrastructure. And three is machine learning. Uh, let's look at them one by one. Com computing power. Uh, today, um, there have been uh, great advances in uh, uh, multiprocessor, uh, what's called parallel pr processing through multi-core CPUs or graphical processing units. That allows us uh, to execute instructions on machines uh, uh, very fast um, and beyond anything else we've seen before. Programmable infrastructure refers to what you must have heard before being referred to as the cloud. Uh, so the cloud is not just about virtualization. The cloud is about being able to create on demand an entire computing infrastructure for the processing that you need to do on your data. And last but not least is machine learning. So machine learning, advancing machine learning, allow us to uh, make computations that were impossible before. And it allows us to build cybernetics, meaning systems that where human interaction, human in the loop um, is always present and higher value on processing can be obtained by letting the machines learn from the interactions. An example of that is natural language processing. Uh, as you know, you've always been able to store your data in databases, uh, well-structured uh, uh, systems where you store your data into rows and columns. Uh, but the fact is that 80 to 90 percent of all content is unstructured. It's the articles, the content in the articles of your journal, so the content in your, in your book, the comments of the authors about a, an article uh, or the recommendations for a, a particular product. So um, these advances in uh, algori algorithms uh, have allowed companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon uh, provide greater value uh, to their customers. We're living at a moment of tremendous opportunity. If I may embellish my earlier metaphor, um, think, imagine that you just discovered your own planet. It's your planet. It's entirely new. Through prior research, you know that there, there are very valuable resources underneath the surface. You're orbiting around it now, and now you're saying, okay, my mission is to find, dig, capture, extract, and mine these resources so I can get value from it. And, um, you know, you see, your data is your planet. <laughs> That's the metaphor. And it can be oil, it can be natural gas, it can be any precious metal, it, it can be anything else. Um, and the results of, of uh, mining um, your data will have the comment equally uh, 
tremendous value uh, as mining a new planet. So the infrastructure capabilities and the algorithmic capabilities available to us have reached a tipping point. These things are no longer the bottleneck for us. The bottleneck is our ability to innovate and our imagination. How can we make use of those resources? Um, and the challenge is to embrace new ways to extract value so, so, so that we can deliver that value to our customers, to your customers. A number of publishers are already doing just that. Uh, and we will hear some of their success stories in just a minute from my fellow presenters, Jim Bryan of Trajectory and Sibyl Wan of Sparho. Of course, the machines can crunch the numbers all day long uh, and do so at lightning speed. But as of yet, no computer has been able to create an original idea. So fear not, um, <laughs> the professional instinct and a uniquely human ingredient of gut feeling uh, is still valuable and on demand. In my view, instinct and intuition uh, have a place in the world of publishing. And I believe that the machines are here to help us, to make us more powerful, not to replace us. If we look back at the first industrial uh, revolution, there were some people who were concerned that machine-based manufacturing would eventually take over, leaving the human from the outside looking in. As we all know, that didn't happen. What did happen is that we were able to produce uh, products and, and increase our, our uh, GDPs um, a lot faster and a, a greater scale than ever before. Uh, today, there is an analogy with that in, in the sense that um, much like machines in the first industrial revolution allow us to transform raw materials into physical products, today machines can help us transform data into information, into information products. Uh, similarly, creating the landscape for tremendous advances. World Economic Forum Executive Chairman Klaus Schwab recently wrote uh, that we were, ent we were entering an era that he calls the fourth industrial revolution. He says, we stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we live, work, and relate to one another. In its scale, scope, and complexity, the transformation will be unlike anything humankind has experienced before. Clearly, the world is changing, and it behooves all of us to change with it. If we remember Darwin, throughout history, it wasn't the strongest who survived. It was the species that was able to adapt. Today, our willingness to get beyond our fears and to begin tapping into the value inside our data will differentiate the pioneers from the laggards, the winners from the losers. In my view, our industry is rapidly approaching what Andy Grove, retired CEO of Intel Corporation, calls a strategic inflection point. The point where there are two major pathways, doing business as usual or embracing and adapting to the new. Grove says that at this moment, these pathways are fairly close together, but they will soon diverge into a growing gap between growth and success or entropy and decline. The dilemma is, do you want to be a dynamo or do you want to be a dinosaur? Let's not let fear um, stop us. Let's start digging and exploring and extracting value from our data. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon to talk about how we are addressing this inflection point that I think we all agree where we, we have arrived today. And today, I think we all are in agreement that the biggest problem facing the global book publishing industry is discovery. With so many books now available in so many different formats from so many different um, vendors around the world, the reader is having an increasingly diff difficult challenge in finding your book. So the question that we be began to address at Trajectory several years ago is how can we um, address this in a uh, programmatic way by, by using uh, data science and machine learning? So what we decided to do was to analyze the full text of, of, of a high volume of, of books using natural language processing techniques. And this involves starting at, at analyzing um, a, a book at a sentence level. The first step, as you can see here, is identifying the parts of speech. 
the next step is identifying the, the correlations that may exist between um, words such as modifiers, et cetera, that are, that are provided together. And we're currently doing this in, in English, uh, German, and also in Chinese. Chinese is a little bit more difficult as you can imagine, in, than English, especially if you don't speak Chinese, uh, as well as my colleagues do, thankfully. Um, but it's the same challenge of, of starting with identifying the parts of speech um, as individual words. Chinese is unique because words can be used on a much more interchangeable level um, based on where they appear in a sentence. And, and does it appear to uh, refer to a noun, a verb, a proper noun? It's all based on where it is in the, in the sentence. Um, Chinese is probably more difficult than, than English. German's certainly more difficult than, than, uh, than English as well. But when we analyze a book, we're looking at more than just identifying parts of speech. We're looking at, at uh, the concentration of key words that are normalized um, to remove the most frequently occurring words in the English language. Um, we're looking, in fact, at, at themes. Um, we're looking at, at time periods that exist in a book. And we're looking at the author's unique writing style, which is sometimes expressed based on their, the frequency of use of, of different parts of speech that exist in, in the book. Um, we're doing some simple things like looking at, at sentiment analysis throughout the book and some more complicated things like um, trying to understand um, the complexity of, the, of a writing style. We're using well-known algorithms like Flesh Kincaid, which is very similar to, to Lexile, if you're familiar with that, to assign a reading level um, and a level of complexity based on those standardized algorithms. But in general, when we evaluate a book today through our machine learning algorithms, we're looking at a wide number of individual vectors that create a unique personality for each book. So sentiment is one that is, 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 is easy to deploy and, and really easy to understand. And sentiment involves um, assigning a numeric value of plus five to minus five to a wide variety of keywords. Uh, a plus five word would be a, a word, an outstanding word that doesn't occur very often. And a minus five word would be one that would be um, uh, catastrophic. And, and then there are variations in between. And what we do is we then plot the occurrence of these words throughout the storyline to be able to determine the average sentiment of a book or actually the, the, the whole sentiment flow. And we're doing the same for intensity. And intensity is a variation of, of sentiment except it exists in, in a positive sphere. And we're looking at, at the shift between um, one variation in, in positive or negative and, and another. And it helps us understand the, the level of, of action that may be taking place in a, in a particular story. Some of the key things that we're generating right now are statistical based. Um, in the ebook world, and in fact in the online world, number of pages is, is not as relevant as the number of words. Um, we're also looking at the number of unique words that appear in the story, and we're breaking that down, in fact, by the number of unique words by part, part of speech. And that becomes kind of a fingerprint for an author, author's writing style, we found. Um, we're also generating um, a high level of, of correlation to external data sets that have meaning in, in certain um, supply chain examples. So for example, for English language books that we're processing through our algorithms, we're comparing the number of words that, that appear in this book that would appear in a, uh, an, an English language proficiency exam like, uh, like TOEFL or IELTS or the, the S&T database. So the, the thought is that a potential reader in, in Beijing may have more of an incentive to, to, to buy a book um, if it had a higher degree of, of, of words for a test that they're getting ready to, to, uh, to take. And in fact, we're actually just making those words available to the user to be able to see which words from those exams are on that, that particular test. Where it gets really interesting, though, is, is when we generate the keywords that I referred to. And what you're looking at here is a normalized table of, of the keywords that appeared in this particular book. And, and uh, I think this was a travel book on London, and you can see London 
stands out, and um, and you you get a sense of what the book is about by looking at a word cloud, where it, it becomes even more useful in the supply chain is when we translate the key words into a local language. So if, if someone's looking at this book in China today, they can see a word cloud that defines the book in their local language in Chinese. So. This is a, a useful solution, we think, to book discovery on a global basis. I think what the, the, the one thing I think that we've worked hardest on is um, our, our discovery algorithms uh, by comparing the unique contents of one book against all the books that we processed, we can find the closest matching book. And where this is helpful is, again, in the supply chain where um, retailers and libraries today are, are looking for recommendations. And so often recommendations uh, in the retail sphere today are based on social behavior rather than the actual content of the book. We're generating the recommendations solely on, on the content of the book using the variety of those vectors that, that I mentioned before, including the, the author's unique writing style, the level of complexity, uh, the number of words and the keywords and the themes, etc. So where this becomes practical is where we can add the keywords and translated keywords into uh, a metadata feed that we're pro providing to a retailer like Amazon. And so imagine if you're searching Amazon for a book and you're, you may, if you're Chinese, you may enter in the Chinese word for, for the book versus the English language word for the book and now be able to find the book based on the keyword or the person that appeared in the book or the place that it's mentioned in the book, but using your local language. So um, this is an example of, of, of a practical application of, um, that's one of our colleagues there earlier. <laughs> He, uh, thankfully, he, he, he recognized us in, in the future. And, uh, but this is an example of how big data is being used today with actual book content. And the goal of this, again, is to try to understand through machine learning processes the um, unique attributes of a book to make it more easily to be discovered. Thank, thank you, Jim Bryant, CEO of Trajectory. Thank you much indeed. And then our last presenter is Sybil Wong with Sparho. Sybil. I'm here to tell you a little bit more about our experience um, as a startup that serves solely scientific researchers. So we're a discovery engine for scientific literature alone, um, including mathematics and engineering. Um, so for us, we are facing users who already need to get in touch with all of this data. They need to be on top of it. And for them, what the crisis is, is not the fact that there's more data. More data is great. We want more literature, more information. But the question is how, in a limited amount of time, can we make sure that we scan through all the stuff that is relevant um, and sift out all the stuff that isn't relevant? So for us, it's really an irrelevance crisis. We're streaming so much into our feeds every day. How do we know what to give to our users first um, rather than later? So just a little sense of what this problem is. Um, as Bab has already mentioned, you have two and a half million um, articles being published a year uh, on average. So you're looking at 208,000 articles every month. And this is across science, but as a scientist, I'm not I'm agnostic, right? I might be in biology, but potentially something in engineering should be within my field. Even something in mathematics might be within my field. I can't rule out that these 208,000 articles are relevant to me. However, if you look at the latest uh, survey, um, the median number of articles that a researcher actually reads from top to tail is only 22. And they spend around 30 minutes reading each of these. and. Since the survey was started in 1977, this is the first year in 2015 that that number has plateaued. So it seems to me that our researchers are reaching a real peak of what they're able to digest every month. 22 articles is, is not a small number. Um, and this is 22 articles after they have decided of all these 208,000 which to read. So. In this case, as a researcher say, I'm looking at only being able to parse one article per 10,000 that comes out every day. So that's quite a scary thing. 
if we want to put it into a graphical sense, this, say, this star field is what I'm looking at in terms of trying to read um, in the coming month. Potentially, I may find an article in that little patch, but where do you even begin if you're faced with that star field? So that has been the question that we've been trying to tackle at, at Sparrow. It's not just a recommendation, but recommendation in a timely manner. So one of the really important things when we're talking about recommendation is how do you, how do you understand what the users are using your tool for? You can recommend them all sorts of things. And, and say, in the field of publishing where books uh, may be out of interest or for, for other reasons, um, there's a broader range of motivations for why people want to keep up. For researchers, because we've refined our user base, it's, very, it's relatively easier. So when we look at our users, there's two reasons why they use us rather than Google search. This is a question I get all the time. Um, so why use us instead of Google search? So the fact is that they're not sure what they're looking for, but they do need to know what's going on. So the first thing that they want to get is inspiration for new ideas. I'm a researcher, I need to be on top of what's happening, and also trying to get inspiration every day for what else I should be asking. Can't just go down a rabbit hole. Um, and two, very serious um, problem is staying ahead of the competition. If I'm working on something, I want to make sure that nobody else is working on it. Or if somebody is working on it, we should be collaborating rather than trying to outcompete each other. So those are the two things that we really tried to work out. But understanding the motivations is really important, as I tried to explain here, is that you can't, you can't just work out what people want from what they do. So say, say I run Amazon, and our customer Sam has just bought black socks. My question is, you know, what should I recommend him next, um, given that he's just bought black socks? Without any other further information, um, I could choose to give him more black socks. Maybe he wants blue socks, or maybe he wants shoes to go with his socks. Without understanding why Sam is buying socks, I can't recommend him the right thing. In the same case, um, for us, if our users are looking for inspiration, then I need to give them a range of less stringent matches. So I don't want to give them just stuff that matches their keywords or their, their certain journals of interest. Um, Whereas if they're trying to stay ahead of competitors, um, for those ones, it's almost easier for the machine to help because they know exactly what they're looking for. In a sense, they know the, the, the range of keywords and the range of authors they should be aware of. So one way that we approach the way to give people enough information uh, or enough uh, of a selection to choose from to read is a reductive approach. So the machine is quite good at looking for exact matches and ruling out things that certainly aren't right. So for us, we're tackling it in a way where, okay, so if it wasn't published in the last 30 days, don't show it to them. If it's not even closely related in terms of a discipline, don't show it to them. Um, if they're not related to articles that, or if, if it's not citing articles that match somewhat the keywords of interest. This is all fuzzy, by the way, so um, it's not as simple as this. But this is one way to approach it. So rather than thinking about trying to find the needle in a haystack, you're actually trying to split up the haystack into smaller and smaller haystacks until the person can just kind of wave through it and find a needle. So that's what we're asking our machines to do. So rather than trying to look for that point straight away, we give them, okay, actually, you just need to look through that part of the sky, um, and given your expertise, you probably will find the thing that you need. And so this is, this is what we're, we're trying to do. So going back to what Babis said and also what Jim has been saying, you know, we feel that machine curation or, or the fact that we use machines to recommend things is not a way to replace humans. Machines are very good at doing certain things. They're very good at looking through a huge amount of data and telling you exactly what's happening given the criteria you've given it. Um, and they're also good at finding unexpected results. Um, a lot of the scientific literature is dominated by databases that are used by a lot of researchers. So if I go to PubMed, um, there's actually a two-year waiting time for a new journal to get onto PubMed. So if I'm trying to look for new things, and it's not on PubMed, and I don't actually have any other way of doing it, then that's a, that's a, that's a problem for me. So what, what we're trying to do at Sparrow is to make sure that regardless of you know, the, 
sort of the, um, the esteem of the journal that we make sure that they're streaming into our platform so that as long as the content is relevant, our users are seeing it and our machines can pick out that. So they, they don't bias, so I don't just go to nature, or I just go to science to look for my news, go to Sparrow and I can see a cross section of everything that's coming out. Humans, are the, on the other hand, and this is where natural, learning, uh, natural language processing really will start to help humans, um, is to recognize alternative phrases that describe their keywords of interest. So as a machine at the moment, um, if you're looking for neurochemistry, um, it may be able to pick up neuroscience, um, but potentially brain chemistry isn't going to be picked up. And we need humans to help with training those algorithms to make sure that we can pick those up in the future and we need to collect that data. Um, also for us, you know, humans are good at recognizing stuff that's relevant to them. You know, there's no, there's no difficult maths involved. They just look at something they know. So we want to make sure that people are doing this because every time they do that and every time we record that reaction, we get that data and that's one more thing to help us build our algorithms. So one of the ways that this has really been happening, I think one of the leaders in our field for, for curation and for recommendation is Spotify. Um, they released something called Discover Weekly in 2005, last summer. Um, and what they did was they realized, wait, we actually have all the data we need to make great recommendations. We have two billion user-created playlists. Each of these users has decided that these songs sound right together. You know, it doesn't matter what the songs are. It would be nice to know what the songs are about and therefore make further predictions about if something new comes out, whether they would like to put it in their playlist. But in terms of understanding existing, um, existing preferences, those playlists are the best things that could happen to us. So for them, they just looked at, okay, well, if they're in a playlist, then um, something very simple called collaborative filtering. So say if I have user A and B, um, user A and B share nine tracks that are exactly the same. But user B has three more tracks. So chances are, if I recommend those three tracks to user A, they'll probably find it interesting. So that's one way they've been refining their algorithms. Um, and it is, some, it is something to look at and think about when you're building um, recommendation platforms, aside from just understanding the content, which I think is really, really important, um, but also understanding how your users are reacting to that recommendation. So for us, this is very bright. Um, so what we've done in our new version is to allow pinning. So the previous version has just been personalized feeds. So literature comes through your channel. Um, and if you like it, you click relevant. If you don't like it, you click irrelevant. But there's no way to store it. And there's no way to create a collection of what is most important to you. So we've made sure in our next version, in, in the new version that's actually up now, um, that we have pin boards where people can, one, save the things that they want to read later, share with people later, um, as well as discuss. So we've added comments. Um, we currently don't have the processing power to understand what these comments mean. Um, we could work with Jim, say, to try and understand what's happening. Um, but this is all trying to create the right data for us to understand what the sentiments are and, and why people are looking at these particular um, articles as a cohort and as a relevant collection. So that's that is now being fed into all of our algorithms to make sure that when we do make recommendations, they are more relevant and are based on other recommendations that have been made by users um, in places that you might not even know of. So this is one way that we're trying to make sure our algorithms are more accurate. So my prediction is, <laughs> I think if you're not doing it already, you should be really looking at how are we looking at users collecting things. So imagine, say, for Amazon, if they could understand every customer, what they already have on their bookshelf, and then base recommendations on that rather than just their sales history. That would be a much more powerful thing. And you know, it may be a social way of trying to find that out. Um, but if I'm building a platform where people are already constantly using it, then I want to make sure that I'm collecting all that data so that you know, in a year's time, I can have a much better search algorithm than everybody else. So that's really it for me. Well, thank you. Thank you, Sybil Wong with Sparrow. Well, I have to say, it was a really interesting series of presentations, and I was thinking about just how far this has taken us. We start in the cloud, we end up on a new planet, then I think we were in a different galaxy by the end there. <laughs> it was really quite a journey. But I, I think the final point that Sybil was making was the one that I want to 
sort of push uh, out into the crowd here and get response on, which is that there's data coming in at us from everywhere, but we may have data ourselves that we can use. That's a really, I think, a profound thought that, that we're overlooking the data at hand. We're thinking about this mass of data, the two and a half million articles produced every year, and it may well be that that's useful but more relevant to our work is what's lying right there in front of us. And I'm going to have to share microphones, but Jim Bryant, I see you nodding your head. How do you feel about that? You know, I, I agree. I think that, that we all acknowledge that the volume of new data is just immense. And, you know, in, in the book publishing world, that's, that's um, highlighted by the fact that, that um, there are so much in works that are being created by independent authors. And what we're seeing globally is there's a, a, a trans-border um, transaction that's taking place with books. So for the first time in history, you now have this vast number of books that are being released every year in a, in a local environment that weren't there before. So this compounds the need for creative ways of, of, of discovery. Right. All right, well, with that then, that was my question for the panel. I wonder if you've got any questions for anyone. If it's for a particular panelist, let us know. Any questions at all? Yes. Anthony. Thank you, Christopher. Um, can you hear me? We can. No. Okay, it's a question for Sybil. Um, I was looking at your site when you were speaking, and uh, I was looking at the old site because I couldn't, didn't have time to sign in. But anyhow, um, the question is, you seem to be working with researchers, and you mentioned this. Are you working with researchers, and how are you getting at them, and how are you monetizing them? Okay. Well, that's, it, that's an it, excellent it, question. It's an excellent question, yeah. and, um, and, and what I understand is that you are getting at them because you're listening to them, and that's a yeah. key part of this, that they are uh, giving you a feedback loop, mm -hmm. which is developing the product further. Yes, yeah, so uh, our, our company started off in Cambridge, and, and the reason why we based in Cambridge earlier on was that we could sit in the labs of the people that we were serving. Um, and this continues to this day. We've now moved to London, uh, but we still go out and speak to our users pretty much a few times a day, uh, no, a few times a week. Um, and it's, it, it's really important. We're at the moment building version 4.0 at the same time as we're trying to talk to our users. They actually are putting input into our search algorithm. So we've, um, we've completely rebuilt it um, in the sense that our previous database couldn't handle the number of items that were coming in. Um, and now we've rebuilt it so that it can handle over 100 million items and give a millisecond response on the website. Not that our researchers care. <laughs> but So it's important for us to make sure that as we're building, we're talking to all these researchers. Uh, we know them by name, almost. So we have running relationships with them. We email students and, and professors to see if they want to get in touch with us. And that's how we build it from the ground. And I'll follow up because Anthony did ask about monetizing. Is there, uh, yes. is there a business model with all of this? Yes. So because it is an academic tool, our overall, our overwhelming aim is to not charge the users. So we are looking at ways to monetize in the sense that are, are people wanting to get in touch with our researchers in a way that is valuable to them? You know, is it a job effort? Is it somewhere where you know, it's content that they didn't know before that existed um, that doesn't sit within research, academic research publications? So we're looking at ways where companies do want to start exposing their brand to our users we're acting as quite a big gatekeeper because we don't want to dilute the use of the tool. We want, it to make, we want to make sure that it still is the most efficient way to scroll through your research and make sure you're on top of things without it just being an ad platform. Right. Uh, I have a question for my colleague, Babis Marmanis, and we'll get that microphone to you, Babis. And, and, and that is about uh, uh, efficiency. I mean, uh, the overwhelming numbers of articles, the data dilemma is the flood of data. We have oceans of it. I guess at one point they referred to them as lakes, and I think now we're moving up to oceans. Um, efficiency is key here, uh, isn't it? And, and, and how, does, uh, how do we attack that point to become more efficient at processing all of this? It's not just computer power. Yeah, I mean, at the, at the high level, there has always been two ways to address computational challenges. The one was brute force, <laughs> which you don't want me to talk about. <laughs> and the other one was being smart about 
what data are you going to process and how are you going to process them. Not all techniques are equivalent. Not all algorithms that Jim and, and Sibyl mentioned are equivalent. Um, one, for example, smart way to approach it is the examples that uh, Sibyl gave about uh, finding the clusters in the galaxies and focus only on those rather than the entire night sky. Uh, or the example from Spotify looking into the playlists. The playlists already identify correlations. The actual technique is called item-item based recommendation or user-user based recommendation. Uh, the techniques that uh, Jim mentioned are content based recommendation. Not all these things are equivalent. So you narrow it down by uh, employing key heuristics. I mentioned earlier about intuition and gut feeling of the people using the new uh, techniques and the computational power. The same thing is, uh, is true uh, for someone who builds a solution for that. Uh, being smart about, given what it is that you really want to do, uh, select uh, those techniques um, and these infrastructures that you will be most, most efficient. Right. As machines can, will not do it for you. A human has to decide. Right. You know, I'm reminded, if you'd pass the microphone to Jim, I'm reminded of a comment. I think he was a, a Nobel Prize economist, uh, a, a, a British economist, who said something like, um, if you torture the data long enough, it will tell you what you want to hear. Um, and, and there is something to that, I think. And, and I want to ask Jim Bryant finally then about, um, you know, what we're saying is no the reader, know the researcher, know the customer, but in a way it's also uh, for the data scientists like yourselves to know yourselves, know the data. Absolutely, and, and, and content is, is one component of, of machine learning. And machine learning happens only because there's human interaction saying, yes, this is good, no, that's bad. And if you have enough people doing that and, the, the, and you provide the machine with curated examples of what you're looking for, it's really fascinating to see um, uh, machine learning platforms be able to respond and, and it be able to identify the next book as matching something that you might be looking for. All right. Well, I want to thank again our panel, uh, Jim Bryan, CEO of Trajectory, my colleague Babris Marmanis, our CTO and Vice President, and Sybil Wong from Sparho. I want to thank you for joining us. We have uh, some refreshments outside. Please stay for those. Please stay for a further conversation. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.